Some of you have been here since Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, and it's been about a year since we, since we started this. We've been on and off in this book. But what I want to do is go back to last year in March when the infamous time where we had to stay home and people were at home more than ever before. COVID had cooped us all up in our homes. And the one thing, actually one of the things that kept us busy, if you'll go back to that time, you'll remember that you probably were one of these part of the statistics. And that was that puzzles began to be taken off the shelf and done once more. And I, and I heard that there was one large company of jigsaw puzzles that saw a 370% increase in sales within the first few weeks of COVID shutting things down. And then they said that over the coming months, they said that their sales quintupled and they couldn't keep up with the demand. And I, be, and I began to think, I'm like, what is it about puzzles that people, they have thousands, millions of shows and TV and, and screens to go to, and yet people are going to the puzzles. And I think what happens is that when you do one of them, there is just this satisfaction that no show can, can offer of completing a puzzle to see how all these pieces fit together. And perhaps you've been stretched within your own family relationships as you've worked on this, and hopefully you've drawn closer together over the time. But the way that puzzles work is just that you get a whole bunch of pieces and it's up to you to put them all together to make it show one big, beautiful picture like the picture on the box. By, by design, they are each to fit in their own specific places and if they're in the wrong spot, it just looks wrong. The picture doesn't work. And what I want to do today, I think is it helps me to understand what we, what we, where we've been in Colossians and what we do every week is that puzzles, uh, the, the scriptures is sort of like a puzzle. That we don't do the whole thing all at once, but we take pieces of it. And what we need to do is put those pieces in the right place when they fit with the surrounding pieces, helping to enhance the picture of the whole book of Colossians, but also fitting it into the larger Bible uh, story. And so what I want to do today, I know that we've been in this for a while, and so maybe what we need to do is take a look at the picture on the box again to see what it is that we are trying to, to, to make. And what I think is helpful for us is to review the truths uh, just at this juncture in, in September where things sort of seem new again, things in the school year and other ministries are kicking off that I thought it'd be good for us to look again at this whole book to see where we've been and also because there have been quite a few new people join us recently, I think it's good for you guys to catch up and see where we, where we have been. And, and what I think that you'll see is that not only will God bless the reading and the review of the truths of the gospel as we do this, but also he will reveal to us more and more his glorious son and what we are about as, as a church. So what I want to do is just go back. So if you go to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to work our way through this just to see where it is that we've come from. And then we'll continue in the coming weeks to, to look further at these things. But Colossians began with us meeting a group of people in the ancient city of Colossae where they had trusted in Jesus Christ. They had believed the gospel of Jesus. And this meant that those people in that place had heard and believed the truth about themselves, that they have all fallen short of their creator's commands. And that they recognize they have personal guilt for their own sins and the coming wrath of God as its wages. But not just the bad news. The good news is that God had sent his son into the world to pay our penalty, to become human like us so that he can purchase our salvation. And he did it by living without sin and dying for our sins so that he could pay our penalty and that we could receive his reward. And this message of salvation had come to Colossae, and it was carried out. This, this good news of salvation was carried out completely, and it was offered by God to everyone, no matter who you are or what you have done, because of God's great love towards sinners. And so the recipients of this letter were those in that city who were trusting in Christ for salvation as their Savior and as their Lord. And I don't know how much time had gone by since they had become this church there, but there came a time as, as they were grounded in the gospel that the occasion for a letter like this came up. It might have been five years later. It might have been 10 years later. But what they needed at this time was wisdom from above. 
See, it was that, that, that over time, gospel misunderstandings were being brought to them. They were infiltrating the church, and now they were wondering what was right and what was wrong. Did we know the gospel? Is it true? Is Jesus really enough? And I think that's one reason why this book has been so applicable to us, because it answers that very question. They needed to discern how sufficient Christ is. Because what, I, what, we, what we have found that is taking place here is that there were people coming to these Christians and compelling them to obey certain religious rules as if Christ hadn't already fulfilled them. They were also being convinced that they were to follow certain spiritual practices and experiences as if Christ couldn't fulfill them. And so the question that had arisen was, is Christ really enough? We believed on Christ, we, we were, were believing the gospel, and now we're wondering, is, is he enough or is more still needed? The, the rumors that were going around in this church and in this community, in this culture, were things that you, you might have heard them say something like, you know, you, to please God and to be really worthy of God, you need to do, you need to follow a specific spiritual program. And the more that you do, the better. And so faith in Jesus is good. Go ahead, do that. But you still need to do more. And among them, one of their men, Epaphras was his name. He left that city. He went to go find Paul. Paul would know the answer. Is this right or is this wrong? And he found Paul and he reported to him the question that they were wondering, the, the question that was rest, they were wrestling with. And it is this. Is Christ really enough to fully please God? Or is more needed? This is a question that we all have wondered at times as well, I think. Because it sounds so simple. It sounds so easy. And yet we, we come to Christ and we got we to gotta figure out who he is and what he has done. And is there anything else lacking? Anything else that we can add? And this is what Paul writes Colossians to answer. And this is why we have an interest in this book. Because we as a church have believed this gospel message. This is what we stand on. And whenever we think that there might be more or that Jesus is less than we think he is, we need to come back to a book like this. In fact, the whole Bible teaches us who Christ is and how powerfully efficient and sufficient he is to save us from our sins. And so we need to wonder, is the gospel that we have heard true? And Paul writes in response to that very question. Now, what we've seen again and again over the past sermons that we've done in, in the book of Colossians is, in summary, we have it in three words, I hope. And that is that Christ is all. And now, if you go to chapter 1, we'll just go, this, go somewhat in order. In verses 4 and 5, Paul, the first thing he does is he affirms their faith in Christ Jesus. He affirms their love for one another. And he affirms that their hope is in heaven. Just hearing about these Christians from this report of this one man, he says, wow, they've got faith in Christ, they've got love, and they've got hope. Those are the three evidences that we can often see in a person's life who has been genuinely converted. Faith, hope, and love. And then he says to them, okay, so you, the gospel that you heard, that message that you heard and believed is what he calls, the, in verse 5, the word of truth. So he's telling them, you know it. You, you don't have it wrong. This is true. And he goes on to say that they've understood it pr properly. That it is uh, salvation by the grace of God. And to show them how decisively they have been saved, he moves into verses 13 and 14 where he paints a picture like this. He says that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And in fact, that son, that royal and reigning son is our redemption, he says. He is the forgiveness of our sins. And so we see that Christ is all. And Christ has done this where we are no longer in the place that we were. We are fully removed and replaced into the kingdom of God. And so when we want to summarize the gospel in John 3, 16, we know that God so loved the world. But we have to go further than that. The gospel isn't just that God loves us. The gospel is that he sent his son. And what we find that his son has done on our behalf is to come and purchase our freedom from the slavery to sin in the devil's domain. And he has 
purchased our redemption by his own blood to appease his father and the wrath of God that was coming upon us. And what he's done is he's taken us, he's redeemed us, and he's carried us into his kingdom and planted us there, making us the children of God. This is what the gospel teaches. This is what Christ has done for you, for all who believe. And this is what John 3, 16 finishes with. He gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so by faith in this gospel, we are saying that Christ is all. That Christ has done it all for us and we can be saved through faith in him. And then we come to this idea or the question perhaps in your mind, okay, I believed. And that's maybe where the Colossians were. They believed. Yes, I understand the gospel. I, I see it. I believe it. Yet what assurance do I have that all of this will take place? It will come to fruition before God comes in judgment. Because I still sin. There is still more work to be done. So how do I know I can trust Jesus rather than take matters into my own hands or trust it to somebody else? And so he goes into verses 15 to 20. And he talks here about our Savior, his absolute sovereignty and his unrivaled supremacy. He goes back to creation and, and says that all things were created through him and for him. This is Jesus we're talking about. And that he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So Christ is at the center of everything. He is the purpose for which the whole world existed. And yet we know that sin has come in and, been, and the world has been subjected to futility. Mankind has been lost in sin. And so in regards to redemption, he goes into that as well. That Jesus, he says, all things were reconciled through Jesus by his blood and on his cross. And again and again, you can see how Christ is at the center of everything. Can we trust him? Can, can he do this for us? Can he save us to the utmost? And what Paul is saying here is, you've believed it right. You've heard it correctly. And he is able. He is not just able. He is abundantly able to do this very thing. This is the gospel. Not only who Christ is, but what he has done. And because of what he has done, Paul makes this very practical for us. That those who have faith in Christ, he says in verses 21 and 22... Though you were alienated from God, hostile toward God, rebelling against God, Jesus has come and reconciled you to God and is now purifying you before God. Thank you. <laughs> this is the common testimony of every single believer. Everyone in this room here who believes in the gospel used to rebel. We hated God. We were fighting his authority. We were piling up punishment. And yet, God, in his mercy, not, not us, God willingly chose to send his son into the world to pay for our sins. And he not only removes our sins, but he makes us holy. He gives us his Holy Spirit so that we could be at peace with God and God would be pleased with us. It's all in Christ. And he is saved and saving us and will save us. This is the work of salvation that we've seen in the book of Colossians. Throughout chapter 1 and even in chapter 2, we saw how he saves us. Not something that we need to carry out on our own, but something that he has done already for us. It is the announcement, this is good news. And so the assurance that all of this will be brought to completion, Paul says in verse 22, he says, You believed and, and have trusted in this gospel. And here's how you know that it will be continued. Not just trusting him in the moment of salvation, but trusting him continually until that final day when we will be saved and the Lord returns. And in that he says that if you continue in the faith, if you are stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, which you heard. So that gospel that we heard, the good news that we first believed is the good news that we continue to believe all the way to the very end of our lives. God is at work and he's at work in us through the faith that we have in Christ. And he will continue to do so as we trust in him. So Paul's repeated response to those who were questioning whether Jesus is sufficient 
whether Jesus really is enough for salvation, is to emphasize his almighty supremacy in all things. If, if that's how we see Christ, then we won't doubt whether he is sufficient or not. He, whether he can save us, whether he will finish the work that he began, if we see Christ this way. So Paul has set out to show us again and again. And so Christ alone will save us. And church, we need to, as we see in this church as well, in Colossians, we need to begin by faith and we need to continue in this faith. And Paul adds the goal, his goal as the apostle. He says in verses 28 and 29, my goal, he says, is to toil and to struggle for your faith in Christ to mature, to be complete. And so though we, we start one day, we continue to grow and increase and strengthen our faith. And Paul is continuing to preach the gospel and to teach the gospel so that we know Christ more and our faith increases. This is where they were. They were lacking in, in faith in the way that they needed to just know Christ more. So Paul's teaching them here. He says, this is my goal. I pray to that end. I work to that end. I teach to that end. And it was good news to see in chapter 2, verse 5, Paul there, as in, in a sense their pastor from a distance, says, I rejoice to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So they are not succumbing to the temptation to add to Jesus or to take away from Jesus. They're continuing, and Paul says that's exactly what you need to do. That faith that you put in Christ at the very beginning, if you go back however many years it was that you believed the gospel, that same faith is how we are to walk today. And God intends that that would only become stronger over time. And so in chapter 2, verse 6, he says this. He says, positively, you just need to keep doing what you're doing. There we read, I lost my spot here, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so you received him by faith, so keep walking in him. And that is so encouraging for us to know that we have enough. We are enough in the sense that we have believed the gospel and it's not as if we need to add something quickly more. We need to quickly add more things to Christ. We just continue to believe and God will see us through. So he says, keep walking in him. And verse 8 says, see to it, and this is the negative side, see to it that no one deceives you from being led astray from walking in Christ. So faith in Christ is where we need to be. We're not to go to the left or to the right. We are to stay on this path to walk in Christ. And so we need to be proactively growing in him. And we also need to be preventatively guarding from being led astray. He says, you're right there. You're on the right track. Don't leave it. Keep going. And then he jumps into these verses that, that tell us why Jesus and nothing else can save us. He says, look at what, what he's already done in you. In verses 9 to 15 in chapter 2, he tells us that he's filled us with his presence, the presence of God. It says that he's removed our sinful spirit and replaced it with his Holy Spirit that we have died with him to the power of sin, that we've been raised with him to newness of life. All these things, whether we feel it or not, are true. God has done this. It says that he's forgiven all of our sins and also that he has taken away the only thing that the devil could damn us for. And that is our guilt for our trespasses. And that he has now disarmed the devil. So what has Christ left undone that we still need to pick up? What is it that anyone or anything else is needed so that Christ and, and our salvation will be complete? It is not Christ plus anything. It is Christ plus nothing. Because Christ is all. And God has planned it in such a way that he would be at the center of everything. Not only creation, but redemption and eternity. Christ is all. And therefore, verse 17 pointed out, that we have the real Savior, the only Savior, and therefore all the other rules that we could follow are just going to point you back to the need for that one Savior. And you have Him, He says. And then He says in verse 19 that all those things that people seek, those experiences, those feelings within us that, that make us feel like we're growing, that we're healthy spiritually, He says, you don't look externally, just hold fast to the internal presence of Christ in you. 
And in many ways, this simplifies it for us, doesn't it? That so many ways the world wants to tell us the way that we think like the world is we've got to earn it. We've got to go get it. We have to get more. But yet what we find in Jesus himself is everything that we need to be saved. And chapter 2 flows into chapter 3, pointing out that nothing else but Christ is able to help us, to stop us from sinning, and to help us produce real righteousness in our own lives. In other words, as we've seen again and again, Christ is all. So I think that we, going back over those two chapters, we should be astounded at what we've seen Christ offer us what he has done for us, who he is. And all the time, desire to know him more and more as he is revealed in the scriptures. And I think together, as we gather together each week like this, and anytime we gather with other believers, that we need to center ourselves again. We need to learn more and more of, of his amazing grace and immeasurable love for us. That we need to remember again and again how powerful and preeminent and sovereign and supreme he really is. To know him as this will only bolster your faith that your salvation will be complete. And that we would rest deeper and deeper in his full forgiveness and his reconciling redemption. And that we would together trust stronger and stronger in the one who lives in us. The one who has been given to us. The one who chapter 3 verse 1 says is seated at the right hand of God. And verse 3 says, is our salvation security? And verse 4 says, is in fact our very life, our guarantee of future glory. Christ is not, at the, not just at the center of the universe. He's not just at the center of, of the gospel. He is at the center of our very lives. And we need to know him as he is. And that's why Paul says at the beginning of chapter 3, he says, based on who Christ is, based on where Christ is, we need to set our minds on the things that are above. And perhaps our lacking in spiritual growth is because we don't have our minds set on the things that are above. Where Christ is, where he is reigning and ruling and fully pleasing to God on our behalf. So we need to continually behold him according to his word, which is the instrument of increasing and strengthening our faith in him. And that's what we set out to do. That's why we come to the word of God, because that's what it is intended for. And so I hope that you've been encouraged as we've seen these things. Colossians has instilled in me time and time again that Christ is all. And I hope that he's done the same for you. Now, after these great truths about the life of our Savior, Paul shifts and he says, now that we've seen Christ, we're going to look at your life. We need to look at our own lives with Christ now in them. And, and to all those who believe this good news, who have faith in the gospel, who continue to walk in Christ, he says to us that something amazing has happened. Internally, which we cannot see, is that in verse 10, 9 and 10 of chapter 3, it explains our present reality. He says, you have put off the old self with its practices and you have put on the new self. So we are entirely different people now. And again, I say it, whether you think, whether you believe it, whether you feel it or not, this is what God does for us. He doesn't just remove your sins or draw God's attention away from your sins. He transforms you so that now instead of going in sin, you have totally changed and you are going in righteousness. And this is all done by faith. Mysteriously and miraculously, God has changed who you are. We were once in Adam, our first parent, whose image of God was marred in him. And now we are in Christ, the perfect image bearer of God. And so now our lives should be radically different. We are a whole new people. In fact, believers are said to be a whole new humanity. We are so different from the world that we are our own, in a sense, spiritual race. We are the children of God. And therefore, Paul says, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror and see what you see. Before you have done anything on your own, this is how God sees you. Verse 12 in chapter 3. He says, you are God's chosen ones, 
holy, and beloved. In spite of being lost in sin, God loved us. And he selected us mercifully. And he made, made us holy. That in spite of all that, God has done everything necessary. And now he says, you need to live according to who you now are. And if clothing was what we did, our behavior, our deeds, our thoughts, all of these things, he says you need to take off the old clothes that you used to wear. And he says things in verses 5 and 8, put off sexual immorality and evil desires and put away anger and filthy language. Those things accentuated your old self, but you're not that person anymore. You have Christ in you, and now you need to wear things that highlight who you are, that reflect your whole new nature. And so he says in verses 12 to 14, we're commanded to begin the new practices, which are kindness and humility, forgiveness and love. And just as we were sinners, we sinned because we were sinners, now we ought to be holy because we have a holy new nature. This is part of the gospel. It's not just that God saves you from your sins and somehow we, God just looks at us and says, yes, you're done. He says, no, I'm going to go to work on you. You're not just going to be declared righteous at the judgment day. You are going to be a saint. And that's why he gives us his own spirit to change our desires, to want holiness. For so long, we've only wanted sin, and now he's transforming our desires and also the, empowering us to be able to do those new desires, which is to perform righteous acts. And this is where we find ourselves in Colossians. We've gone through this gospel to say, yes, this is what it is, and amazingly, this is what Christ has done. But there's more to it. We need to live the gospel, not just know the gospel. And so my, what I want to land on here is just a few points in where we are. We're sort of in the middle of what to put off and what to put on. And I want to point out just a few things here to keep us considering what this is, what this means for us as we continue to look, this, or look at this over the coming few weeks. Specifically in chapter 3, verse 10, how we have been totally changed. I want you to consider how much your life has changed. And I want to show you what Christ is doing in you now. So first, I want you to notice the kind of life we ought to live. That in many ways, people might say, well, you're forgiven or there is forgiveness. So it kind of doesn't matter how you live. But here it says we are to put away sin and we are to put on holiness. And this is precisely due to verse 10. It says that we've received the new self. And it says this, and it's after the image of our creator. The new self is in the image of God. And therefore, to be an image bearer is to reflect the character of God himself. And this is exactly how we were designed originally to live. He says it so many times throughout the scriptures, be holy for I am holy. And therefore, we ought to, because we have the new self, we, we're, we don't, we're not just required to be holy. We also need to begin to practically perform holiness, to do the commands of God. And Christ alone is sufficient to save because he not only takes away our sins, but he makes us holy. And this will happen over time, but it is our responsibility to go and pursue holiness because we now with Christ can do this. And that's the second thing I want to point out. We have a part to play. These are commands that he says to put off sin, to put on holiness. And the commands are not for God to do in us. God is doing this in us. But we are to receive these commands. We are to participate in our sanctification. That God says, I'm going to make you holy. And part of the process I've determined is that you will be a part of it. And so I just want to stop here and say, are you pursuing this? Because this is our command. But again, it's not because you got to do your part. It's not as if Jesus did his part and now you got to do yours to get saved. But it's that Christ is transforming you. And one of the evidences that we see that this is taking place is that you yourself want holiness and are even increasing in practical holiness. We are saved by faith. And then we live by faith. 
And so we need to consider this idea that in both of these cases, not only the image of God, but also our responsibility because it's who we are. The fact that Christ is in you means that Christ should come out of you in the way that you live, in the way that you think, in the way that you speak. And this is what Paul is connecting now. He says, this is the gospel, but this is how you see the gospel in action. That his people will change. That his people are different. And so third, I want you to notice something here. And it's really encouraging for myself and I'm sure for you as well. It says in verse 10 that the new self is being renewed. That means that we're not there yet. He is renewing presently. We are being renewed. And so that's encouraging to me. And that should be a reminder for all of us in the church that God is still working on me and God is still working on you. And he is slowly conforming us to the image of his son. And so we need to be patient with one another. We do need to pursue holiness, but we also need to recognize that we need to be patient. And so to understand us as a church, to say we need to understand where each person is at. And so that same point is true, that Christ in you means Christ will come out of you. It, it means increasingly so, no matter how small the increments may be. And then the fourth thing I just want to point out here is I want you to notice how, how God renews us. And that's in verse 10. He says he's renewing us in knowledge. That the more you know Christ, the one who is in you, the one whose image you bear, the more you know him, the more you will become like him. And perhaps when we don't pursue holiness, and maybe when we are very weakly fighting against temptation, that it's just due to the fact that we have spiritual pride, that we might think that we know all there is to know about Christ, we don't need to know anymore, or maybe spiritual laziness that we just don't desire to know Christ. But the way that God is transforming us and making us more holy is through knowledge of him that then is carried out and lived out in our own lives. And so this is what we need to see, that Christ in you means that Christ is going to come out of you increasingly so, and it's connected to knowing him truly. And so all those four things there, this is where we're at in Colossians, and I hope and I pray that God will continue to train us, to teach us, to make us more like Christ. And this is what Colossians has set out to do. The question of whether Christ is enough. Is he really enough? And I pray that you've seen in his word how he is. How he is all. And so as we, we, we've come so far in this letter, it feels sometimes like this letter was written just for us. And what a blessing it is to know that we are on the right track. That we know the truth. That we can experience the love of Jesus Christ in our own lives it is, as it is revealed in the gospel, as it is recorded in the scriptures, and as it is reassured in our hearts by God's spirit. And so my prayer is that as we, Strathmore Alliance Church, continue to move forward from here, that God would continue to increase in us those three evidences of a genuine conversion and a genuine church, that it would be that we increase in faith in Jesus Christ that we increase in hope in God's promises, and that we increase in love for one another. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the way that you speak to us, the way that you have called us to sit under your word and to listen to what you have to say. And because you are the God of the universe and also our heavenly Father, we as your children come submissively and humbly and we desire to know the truth. And what we find there is a wonderful gospel for sinners like us, not only saying that there is salvation, but that there is everything that we need in one person. And we thank you for revealing Christ to us. And I pray that as we continue to behold him in multiple different ways, as according to your scriptures, as you reveal him to us, I pray that we would be stronger in our faith as we know him more truly and clearly and that we trust him according to the gospel. Father, thank you for this very book of the Bible. 
And I pray that you would continue to grow us, make us healthy spiritually as a church, and may we live according to it, not just know it, but live according to it, to your glory. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.